One of the reasons why I think many people believe that humans could not have lived with the poster children of evolution or that humans could not have lived with the fearfully great or terrible lizards as the word dinosaur is defined is because they simply cannot imagine humans really living with dinosaurs. Their ideas of dinosaurs have come from movies, they've come from magazines, they've come from books, they've come from Hollywood. And to think that a human being or that numerous humans could live with animals that had tails that swayed like cedars, that weighed thousands of pounds, that can grow to be 10, 15, 20, 25 feet long is simply unimaginable to some people. They think that these animals would have swayed their tails and knocked someone in the head and killed them very easily. That humans simply could not have lived with dinosaurs like Deinonychus because their teeth were too sharp, their claws were too big, they were sickle-like and if they had ever met a human or run into a human then they surely would have killed these creatures. Some look at dinosaurs like Allosaurus and think that his head that was a few feet long, his teeth that were serrated that were very long, or the, the teeth of Tyrannosaurus rex that were about the size of bananas, that simply features on creatures such as these were simply too terrible for man to ever have contemplated living with or being on the same planet as, as these creatures at the same time. I think that there has uh, been a picture painted of these creatures both in movies, in books, and in other places that has caused many people and many Christians simply to think that, well, how could we have survived on this planet with these kinds of creatures. Aside from the details we talked about in our last lecture, aside from all of the evidence we have for humans seeing these creatures and drawing these creatures, carving them onto rock, aside from some of the other scientific evidence we have for dinosaurs living in more recent times rather than millions and millions of years ago, some people think, well, even if they could have uh, lived with them as far as just wiping out those 70 million years, how could humans have lived with them? Well, what I try to encourage people to do is to think outside of the box a little bit. Because I think that we have been kind of wedged into this box or hedged in by a box that tells us humans are too scrawny, we're too ignorant, we're not smart enough to have ever lived with creatures like dinosaurs. But then when you begin to see that there are a lot of other animals on this earth with which we uh, live, you begin to think maybe we could have lived with these creatures. There is one gentleman who a few years ago made a statement saying it is ludicrous to suggest that man cohabited with the dinosaurs in an alley-oop kind of world. According to this brother in Christ, he says basically the idea of humans and dinosaurs living together, that only exists in the cartoons. It is ludicrous to think that humans could have lived in this world with dinosaurs. He went on to say in another source, man could not have lived in a world full of dinosaurs. Why? Because their tails were too long? Because they ran too fast? Because they were too big? Because their teeth were too sharp? Because their claws were too scary? I would like for you to stop for just a few minutes and think about some of the animals with which we inhabit this planet today. We live on this planet with a lot of amazing creatures and creatures that are somewhat frightening. Have you ever heard of the Komodo dragon? Komodo dragons are the largest lizards currently living on earth today. They can grow to be about 10 feet long, weigh between 2 and 300 pounds. They run as fast as a fast dog and they are intimidating creatures. I've been told that they can eat 80% of their body weight in one meal. So if you had a 100 pound Komodo dragon, he could consume 80 pounds of meat in one meal. Think about taking Komodo Dragon down to McDonald's and ordering him some cheeseburgers. How many cheeseburgers could he eat? Quarter pounders could he eat at one sitting? Well, quite a few. The Komodo Dragon not only can uh, consume large amounts of food in one meal, but he also has deadly bacteria that lives in its mouth that does not hurt him or kill him, but when he bites his prey, well, it eventually uh, paralyzes them and eventually it leads to their death and they consume them. But we not only live on this planet with Komodo dragons, we live on this planet with lions and tigers and bears. Animals with sharp claws, with big teeth, with powerful bodies. 
And humans have lived with these creatures for thousands of years. Not only have we lived with these creatures for thousands of years, but for many years humans have trained these creatures to do all sorts of things. They can be trained to jump through a hoop. They can be trained to stand up on their back legs. They have been caught and captured by men for centuries, and not just for centuries, for millennia. We have caught Komodo dragons there in zoos all over the world. We've caught lions. I personally don't catch these creatures, but I know some who have. And what about the largest land animal on earth today? The imperial African elephant that can grow to be 22,000 pounds. That has a trunk that weighs two to three hundred pounds. That has massive feet, massive legs. They're massive creatures and they are quite a bit larger, and you may not realize this, than the average dinosaur that once inhabited this planet. The famous dinosaur hunter Jack Horner, he wrote a book some time a while back in which he stated that the average dinosaur was about the size of a large cow. Most people do not realize that most dinosaurs were not the size of Brachiosaurus or Patasaurus or Argentinosaurus. Most of them were smaller than the largest land animal that currently lives on earth. And the African elephant, he could hurt you. He could stomp on you and kill you. He could hit you with his trunk and send you to the hospital. But isn't it interesting that for thousands of years, people have been training elephants, African elephants, Asian elephants, to do all sorts of things. They have trained them to ride uh, some kind of large tricycle, if you will. They have trained these creatures to kick a soccer ball. They have trained 22,000 pound elephants. About 2,200 years ago, the general of the Carthaginian army, the famous general, his name was Hannibal, history records that he took trained African elephants and used them in war, crossing the Mediterranean into Europe, across uh, into Italy to fight the Romans. Trained African elephants. Yes, we live on this planet with some amazing creatures. Some of the most amazing have been caught and captured. You can go to SeaWorld and you can see six to 8,000 pound killer whales. Do you ever stop and just contemplate and think about how almost unbelievable it is, amazing it is, that we take an animal that we call a killer whale. And they're called killer whales for a reason. I mean, they eat thousands of pounds of fish and mammal meat throughout their a lifetime. Thousands and thousands of pounds. They eat seals, they eat sea lions. I read one document that said a moose was found in the belly of a killer whale. Apparently the moose had tried to cross a waterway and the killer whale took it on and ate it. These are vicious creatures in the open seas. I have a friend who lives up in Alaska and up there, I was up there recently and he told me, he said, Eric, I was out fishing for salmon one day and all of a sudden a killer whale came up out of the water with a half of a salmon hanging out of his mouth. That's a scary thought. And yet these same creatures have been captured and they have been trained and tamed to do all sorts of things. If you've ever been to SeaWorld, you know how neat it is to see these creatures jump out of water on command, jump up on a platform, to see humans stick their heads in their mouths. Humans live on this planet today. We do with a lot of amazing creatures. We live on this planet with the largest creature that is ever known to live. And it's not the dinosaur. The largest dinosaur that has ever been found in the fossil record is estimated to have grown to be about 126 feet. They estimate that Argentinosaurus, you can guess where they found Argentinosaurus, I believe, that he weighed an estimated 110 tons. But you know, the largest creature that we've ever known to have ever lived on this earth is still here today. The blue whale can reach lengths of 110 feet, which is not quite as long as Argentinosaurus, but the blue whale can reach weights. The largest one that I've ever heard or read about was right at about 400,000 pounds, nearly twice the size of Argentinosaurus. I've read that you could fit 40 to 50 humans on the tongue of the blue whale, which weighed an estimated 6,000 pounds. And the heart of this creature was about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, weighing nearly 1,400 pounds, about 1,320 pounds. I want you to be impressed by the fact that we live today 
with some of the most amazing creatures that God ever created. So to say that it is ludicrous to suggest that man cohabited with the dinosaurs is simply, and I say this as kindly as I know how, an ignorant statement. Because we live on this planet today with some amazing creatures. How can we do that? How is it that we can function in this life and we can live on this planet with some of the most amazing creatures that ever lived on earth? Because in the first book of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, we read that God made man in His image, in His likeness. And notice what is connected with that very fact. That we are able to subdue the earth. That God has allowed us and made it so, and made us so, human so, that we can have dominion over all of the animals of the earth. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28. When you go to the book of Psalms in Psalm 8, you read the psalmist declaring to God, you have put all things under his feet. That is man's feet. And he says, all sheep and oxen, even the beast of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. Why is it that we can live with killer whales and even tame them, live with lions and tigers and bears and Komodo dragons and even the dinosaurs at one time? Because... God made us different than the animal world. He made us in His image, and that allows us, among other things, to be able to subdue the earth and to have dominion over the earth. Some ask, well, Eric, why doesn't the Bible talk about dinosaurs? If humans really did live with these creatures, as we say they did, that we did in the past, our ancestors did, then why doesn't the Bible talk about these creatures? And it troubles some people. In fact, I had a college student come by my office a few months ago and he said, Eric, this is perplexing me. You say that dinosaurs and humans live together? Well, how is it that they live together and yet the Bible does not mention dinosaurs? He was really bothered by this. And I tried to allow him to see that the Bible is not a book of taxonomy. It doesn't mention all of the animals that ever lived on earth. The Bible mentions several different kinds of animals. It mentions donkeys and it mentions chickens, but it does not mention the duck-billed platypus. It does not mention the penguin. It does not mention the aardvark or many other animals. So just because the Bible does not mention the word dinosaur does not mean that dinosaurs did not live on earth. And also, you must realize that the word dinosaur, as we uh, mentioned in our last lesson, the word dinosaur was not coined until the 1840s. So you would not expect to see the word dinosaur in the Bible that was written hundreds of years before that. And even our first English translation that was done in the early 1500s by Miles Coverdale, that you would find a word that did not appear or was not invented for 300 years in a book that was translated into English 300 years before it was ever coined. And so you wouldn't expect to see the word dinosaur in the Bible, at least not in some of those early English translations. But furthermore, the Bible does tell us in a general way that on day six of creation that God made land animals and by definition dinosaurs are land animals. And on day six of creation, according to Genesis chapter 1, God not only made land animals, but He made humans. God made dinosaurs and God made humans on day six of creation. Are dinosaurs mentioned specifically? No. But the Bible does tell us in Genesis 1 that God made all of the land animals on day six of creation. Really, the idea of humans and dinosaurs living together is very simple because in the very first chapter of the Bible, it tells us that humans and all land animals were created on day six of creation. And if that is not clear enough, when we turn over one other book in our Bible, in the book of Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11, you will find where God says, For in six days, Moses recording this, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. In six days, the Lord made what? Everything but the dinosaurs? No, the Bible tells us that in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. So what does the Bible have to say about the coexistence of humans and dinosaurs? It tells us that humans and dinosaurs were created on the very same day. Specifically, no, it tells us in a more general way. But the Bible also gives us information about a couple of creatures that sound exactly like dinosaurs. You recall in the book of Job when God is talking to Job, you remember that throughout the book of Job, Job was wanting to have a hearing with God and he was wanting to present his case before God and he wanted to 
uh, talked to God about some things that God talked to Job about several animals. And he was trying to impress upon Job that God is the ruler of the universe and not Job. And there were many things that Job did not know. And he did not know all the ways of various animals that God created, including the behemoth, which God said, I made along with you. Now, the English word behemoth is simply transliterated from the Hebrew word behemoth. It's not a translation. We don't really know exactly, exactly what this animal is, and so most Bibles simply use the word behemoth. Well, what is a behemoth in this passage? A lot of Bible footnotes you will read says this is supposed to be either the hippopotamus or the elephant. But when you begin taking a closer look at Job chapter 40, you see that this animal doesn't really sound like a hippopotamus or an elephant. God said, He, that is behemoth, eats grass like an ox. See, now his strength is in his hips, his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. He moves his tail like a cedar. Have you seen the tails of the hippo and the elephant recently? You've seen some of the pictures of the mighty dinosaurs and their tails. Let me ask you something. Does this look like it sways like a cedar? I have never heard anyone say that this resembles a cedar tree or sways like a cedar tree. And certainly I don't see how anyone could say that the stubby little appendage on the back end of the hippopotamus sways like a cedar. And yet God told Job this is a creature he made along with him and he's got a tail that sways like a cedar. Now I ask you, what animal could God be describing here better than a dinosaur that had tail? That certain dinosaurs had tails that were very lengthy. I mean 20 and 25 feet long that weighed thousands of pounds. Behemoth had a tail that swayed like a cedar. God continued describing this creature to Job saying, His bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. This is some kind of mighty creature. Now I have to admit that if a hippopotamus came through these back doors into this building that I would probably be running from it and I would be encouraging all of us to do so because they can grow to be fairly large. They can weigh a few tons. I think the average one weighs three or four tons. I've read where they might be able to get up to six or seven tons, be six or seven feet high perhaps. Fairly large creature. But you see, the description that God gives to Job there in Job 40 is He is the first of the ways of God, or He is the chief of the ways of God. And when you realize that there are animals that once inhabited this planet called dinosaurs, the largest of them from what we know being Argentinosaurus, that grew to be 126 feet long, weighed approximately 110 tons, then you begin to ask yourself, how could God be describing a six or seven ton hippo when we know that animals that were much mightier than that, animals that I believe can accurately be described as the first of the ways of God, the chief of the ways of God. Not only that, God says, only he who made him can bring near his sword. And yet we know from records that the ancients, specifically the Egyptians, they used to go out and hunt the hippo. In fact, they had a day known as harpooning the hippopotamus day. It's very difficult for me to see God describing a hippopotamus here when we know the ancients used to go out and kill them fairly regularly. Not only that, notice that God says His bones are like beams of bronze, His ribs like bars of iron. You recall Argentinosaurus had rib bones that were, we found fossilized in the fossil record, 14 feet Long. What better animal could God be describing here than a mighty dinosaur with a long tail and a massive body and that was at least 15 and a half times larger than the largest hippo that is on earth today. I believe that the description that God is giving us and Job specifically there in Job chapter 40 is that of a long neck, long tail dinosaur. But God continues to describe another animal. Right after the behemoth, he begins talking about Leviathan. And he asks a number of rhetorical questions, beginning with, can you draw out Leviathan with a hook? And of course, the answer to all of these questions is no, this creature is too mighty. In fact, when you begin to read the description of Leviathan in Job chapter 41, you are impressed with a number of things, almost more impressed than you, with this creature than you are with the creature 
known as Behemoth or called Behemoth in Job chapter 40. A lot of people think that Leviathan is or was simply a crocodile. In fact, in a lot of Bible footnotes and in commentaries you will see, well, he's just describing here a crocodile. But notice how God describes this creature. He continues to ask rhetorical questions. Can you put a reed through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Though the sword reaches him, it cannot avail, nor does spear, dart, or javelin. Darts are regarded as straw and bronze as rotten wood. He is describing a creature here that is virtually impossible to be caught. This is one mighty creature. Now, again, we can go back and read the records of the ancients and see where they caught crocodiles and alligators fairly regularly. The historian Herodotus talks about how they caught them, and others have stated that they not only caught them, but they tamed them. I was looking in a journal for young people some time ago. It's in a lot of public schools called Current Science Magazine. And a few years ago, they had a picture of several crocodiles that they had found in some of the Egyptian uh, tombs that had been caught, killed, and mummified. So to say here that this is a crocodile that lived during the time of Job is just hard for me to grasp, especially, especially when God continues to say His undersides are like sharp potsherds or sharp pieces of broken pottery. He spreads pointed marks in the mire or in the mud. You've seen the underside of an alligator or a crocodile before, I imagine. Does their underside, is it like sharp pieces of broken pottery? Does it leave pointed marks in the mud? I haven't seen any that do. On earth there is nothing like Him which is made without fear. He beholds every high thing. Exactly the statement, what the statement means, He beholds every high thing, I am not for sure. But one thing we know is that alligators and crocodiles don't see every high thing. And as we've already mentioned, they've been captured, they've been killed. People have been doing this for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years. The well-known crocodile hunter who has now passed from this life, you recall how he played with these creatures day in and day out. People have captured them. People have killed them. Is this what God is describing in Job chapter 41? And then we read, His sneezings flash forth light, and His eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of His mouth go burning light. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke goes out of His nostrils as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals, and a flame goes out of His mouth. What does that sound like? Is God telling Job about a creature that really doesn't exist? Now some people have said, well, this is just a mythological creature. Well, think about it. God's point to Job is, God is God and Job is not. Job didn't understand everything that was going on and everything that he was saying, and God was trying to impress upon Job that he didn't understand a lot of things simply about the natural world and creatures that God had made. Now, if God was talking about a mythological creature here and Job knew that, I would think Job would be scratching his head saying, what's the point? The point is this is a real creature. God made him. Job can't handle him. Man doesn't quite understand him. And this creature even expels what appears to be fire and smoke out of his mouth at times. Could God do that? Could God create a creature that does that? The reaction I get from some brethren is, you know, God simply could not have done that. Well, I would be very careful saying that God couldn't do something like that. Because I read in my Bible where God is almighty. And if He wanted to make a creature that could, from time to time, expel something out of His mouth that looked like fire and smoke, then I certainly believe He could have. And then when I consider some of the animals that live on earth today, and I consider that there are various animals that expel pretty interesting things, I think, well, maybe there were animals that once expelled fire and smoke out of their mouths. One... I guess you would call him progressive creationist. His name is Hugh Ross. He stated some time a while back, no dinosaur ever breathed fire or smoke. It's interesting to me that this gentleman would make this statement, but he believes that humans and dinosaurs are separated by millions and millions of years. And yet he's so certain that no dinosaur ever breathed fire or smoke. Though he admits that, he says, no human ever saw this creature. We only know about them from the fossil record, but he says he knows that they never breathe fire or smoke. I'm reminded of a creature on earth today known as the electric eel that can produce electricity, if you will, 
voltage and shock you and send you to the hospital, perhaps fatally hurt you, but it does not hurt itself. Have you thought about how amazing that is that there is an animal that can do that on earth alive and well today? Or maybe sometimes you've gone out in your backyard and you've seen the lightning bug or the firefly and you haven't been all that impressed with this creature that can take chemicals like luciferin and luciferous and combine them with oxygen to make bioluminescent light. That is very amazing. One of the funnest things I do with my kids in the summertime is go out in the backyard and catch fireflies and just see them light up from time to time. That is an amazing thing. God made the electric eel. God made the firefly. God made a beetle that we call the bombardier beetle. That can shoot a noxious acidic spray out its back end at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And those of you that do a little cooking, I don't try my hand at that very often. It might be a dangerous thing. Know that at 212 degrees you have the point at which water is boiling. And yet evolutionists say, well, the bombardier beetle just evolved over millions of years. Can you imagine the first time the bombardier beetle was evolving and tried to do this? Boom! Well, I think it would have killed itself, and then that would have been the end of the bombardier beetle. Well, evolution has a lot of problems, and the idea that no dinosaur ever breathed fire or smoke, or there simply could not have been any dragons on earth any time in the past, is simply not a very logical statement in view of the fact that we live on earth today with Amazing animals, electric eels, fireflies, bombardier beetles. Now, we have a dinosaur book titled Dinosaurs Unleashed where we are dealing with, in this book, a lot of evidences and proofs for the coexistence of dinosaurs and humans. It was illustrated by a Canadian artist named Louis Lavoy. We asked him to read Job 41 over and over and over again and do the very best he could, though he's never seen this creature, he's reading a description of it, do the very best he could at illustrating what he sees here. And what he drew was what you see on the screen. And I'm not saying this is exactly what Leviathan looked like. I'm saying it's the best depiction that I've ever seen from just a straightforward reading of Job chapter 41. But what about these stories of creatures in the past that sound like long neck, long tail reptiles that Evolutionists say are separated from men by millions of years. Some of them are said to have breathed fire. What about these stories? Well, they're not called dinosaurs. Of course, as we've already stated, the word dinosaur wasn't around until the 1840s. And so if humans ever lived with these creatures, that word would not have been used. They would have called these creatures, I believe, dragons. Now, ancients used the word dragon from the Greek dracon to refer to any large serpent or reptile, whether real or mythological, whether you're talking about a terrestrial animal, an aerial animal, or an aquatic creature. They use this word dragon in a very broad way. Now, are there some dragon legends that are simply uh, not all that factual? Well, I'm sure there are. Are there some that uh, have elements in them that are not exactly true? I imagine there are. But does that negate every story about every ancient reptile that ever lived? Not any more than you going fishing and catching a fish this big and coming back and telling your family, I caught a fish that big. And you exaggerated a little bit. Or coming home after being chased by a dog and telling your family or your mom or dad, I got chased by a big dog today and maybe it was the size of a chihuahua. I don't know. Well, we might exaggerate some things today. I'm not saying it's good to exaggerate, but we might do that and there be a major truth to that story, though there may be some exaggerations in this. Well, are there exaggerations with some of the stories of the past of large reptiles with long necks and long tails and spikes and horns and claws? Certainly. But recall in our last lecture we talked about if humans ever lived with these creatures, if humans ever saw these creatures, then it makes sense that they would have drawn them. Just like when we go somewhere today, we are coming back with pictures to show people where we have been. But it also would have made a lot of sense that they talked about these creatures a lot. Well, what did they call them? Well, they didn't call them dinosaurs. What did they call them? They called them dragons. I want you to see some statements by those who are evolutionists and what they say about these ancient stories of reptiles. The first statement here is from Carl Sagan, the famous evolutionist Carl Sagan in his book, The Dragons of Eden. He said, the implacable mutual hostility between man and dragon is not a Western anomaly. It is a worldwide phenomenon. Dragons 
said the militant evolutionist Kerr Than in his 2007 article, dragons are found in the myths and legends of cultures all around the world. Okay, so these stories are ubiquitous. They are worldwide. People all over the world, wrote Daniel Cohen, have believed in dragons. Is that because they're all fairy tale creatures? Or is it because humans once lived with these reptiles that in the past were called dragons? The stories, even stated by enemies of Christianity, the stories are worldwide. In a DVD titled Dragons, A Fantasy Made Real, put out by Animal Planet not too long ago, they begin the DVD with this statement. They said, there is one creature remembered in the legends of almost every human culture that's ever existed, a creature depicted with remarkable similarity by the Chinese, the Aztecs, even the Inuit who live in a frozen land where no reptiles are found. Even they have stories of this animal, the dragon. Cultures from different continents. People who had no contact with one another, yet all of them had stories describing the same, what they called, mythical animal. If humans ever did live with dinosaurs in the past, there are at least two types of evidence that would have been left behind. One would be the carvings that we showed in our last lecture, the pictures, and another would be stories. Isn't it interesting that these stories are worldwide and they go back to the beginning of time? Samuel Kramer wrote in his book, History Begins at Sumer. He said the dragon slaying theme was an important motif in the Sumerian mythology in the third millennium B.C. And then we have a quotation here from that same video I mentioned a moment ago. This is the animal about which humankind has throughout our history been most compelled by. This is the animal that throughout our history has been most compelled by. It's a story that is worldwide, dragon legends wrote Science Digest, an article that appeared in Science Digest, dragon legends have been with humanity since the dawn of recorded history. Why is that the case? Is it because these creatures are just made up? Well, if that's the case, then why are they made up all around the world in different cultures and different places? I believe the unbiased person will see that these simply are stories of man's interaction with these reptiles, these fearfully great reptiles that we call dinosaurs. Notice some of the common characteristics of dragons and you tell me what they sound like. Scaly, hard, elongated bodies, long serpentine necks, enormous tails and stout legs, horn, knobby and crested heads, fearsome teeth, claws and spikes with or without bat-like wings, with two legs or four legs. Is this a list of characteristics of dragons or dinosaurs? Well, I submit to you, it's a list of characteristics of dragons and dinosaurs. Because the stories we have of dragons, many of them sound exactly like dinosaurs. And you don't have to take my word for it. Notice again what some evolutionists have stated about this, or evolutionary sources, like the New Encyclopedia Britannica. They referred to dinosaurs as gigantic prehistoric dragon-like reptiles. Yet the encyclopedia was careful to say that dragon legends apparently arose without the slightest knowledge on the part of the ancients of these real animals. And then we have a statement from Daniel Cohen who said, no creature that ever lived looked more like dragons than dinosaurs. Their stories are worldwide. They go back to the beginning of time and they sound like dinosaurs. This is one of the more amazing statements that I've seen on this subject from atheist Carl Sagan, who speculated that humans may very well, he used the word, remember dinosaurs. He indicated that the pervasiveness of these stories is probably no accident. Notice what he speculated a couple of pages later in this book. He said, could there have been man-like creatures who actually encountered Tyrannosaurus rex? Could there have been dinosaurs that escaped the extinctions in the late Cretaceous period? Could the pervasive dreams and common fear of monsters, which children develop shortly after they are able to talk, be evolutionary vestiges of quite adaptive, baboon-like responses to dragons and owls? Do what? He is saying, is it possible that maybe our baboon-like ancestors, that they saw these creatures and they remembered them and they passed down these memories to the following generations so that today when children are scared of monsters, it's because our alleged ancestors, ape-like ancestors, encountered dinosaurs. That's pretty amazing. 
A few years ago, in 2003, uh, in the state of South Dakota, a dinosaur was unearthed that had a knobby skull, a, a whole, almost an entire skull was excavated. And according to the men who excavated it and who later named it, this dinosaur looks so much like what they have heard dragons look like, at least in the stories and in some of the paintings, that they called the dinosaur Draco Rex, which means Dragon King. And it's on display today at the Children's Museum uh, in Indianapolis. A dinosaur that looks like a dragon? Well, notice one of the placards there in the museum what it says about this creature. It said, when we saw this creature's head, we weren't sure what kind of dinosaur it was. Its spiky horns, bumps, and long muzzle looked more like a dragon. Maybe because dragons are dinosaurs and dinosaurs are dragons. Uh, it's a new type of dinosaur that looks like a dragon. As we begin to conclude, I want you to see, just recently there was an article put out by Curthan where he speculated what caused all the dragon legends. Notice what he said in this article. He said, and this is an evolutionist, of all the creatures that ever lived, pterosaurs probably most closely, resembles, uh, most closely resemble the dragons of European legend. The pterosaurs, like Quetzalcoatlus or Pteranodon or Pterodactyl. And yet in this same article, he went on to say, People living in ancient times, two people living in ancient times, a comet streaking through the skies with an icy tail millions of miles long would have closely resembled such a creature. That is a dragon. If comets were the inspiration of some dragons, it could help explain why dragons are ubiquitous in the myths and legends of so many different cultures in all corners of the world. Let me ask you this. Which one of these looks more like a dragon to you? The dinosaur they unearthed that they actually call the Dragon King or a comet flying through the sky. And yet the same author said that there are no animals that look more like the European dragons than the extinct dinosaur-like flying reptiles. There is powerful evidence for the coexistence of dinosaurs and humans. There are rock drawings that go back hundreds or thousands of years. There are stories that go back to the beginning of time. According to evolutionists, we have the Bible that tells us they were both created on day six, and we have our good common sense and reason that tell us we live with amazing creatures today. Why couldn't we have lived with the dinosaurs in the past?